Well, I think we're going to get started here. Can you hear me in the parking lot? <laughs> awesome. Yay. We're going to start this morning singing number 488. Number 488, he keeps me singing. There's a bit my heart of melody. Jesus with the sweet and low. Fair night with me. It's a great day that we can come together, worship you, knowing that you're in control. Knowing that all things go according to your will. You created this world, Lord. We know that here. Lord, I thank you for loving us, for sending your Son, Jesus Christ our Savior. And it's in his name that I do pray. Amen. How sweet to hold a newborn baby and feel the God and joy begin and greater still the calm assurance the child can face the certainty.
time. I want to read a, a scripture. I was uh, reading uh, in the Psalms this last week, and um, you know, the Psalms were written hundreds of years before Jesus was even born. And uh, when you read through those Psalms, uh, they, they have what they call Messianic Psalms. Like, it could have been King David writing it, but he was speaking the words of Jesus. Uh, and, and he didn't even know it. And Psalms 22, when we think about the, the sacrifice of Christ on the cross and what he went through, just listen to Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from my cries of anguish? My God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer. My night, but I find no rest. Yet you are enthroned as the Holy One. You are the one Israel praises. In you our ancestors put their trust. They trusted and you delivered them. To you they cried out and were saved. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by everyone, despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their heads. He trusts in the Lord, they say. Let, let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him, since he delights in him. Yet you brought me out of the womb. You made me trust in you, even in my brother's mother's breast. And from birth I was cast on you. From my mother's womb you have been my God. Do not be far from me, for trouble is near and there is no one to help. Many bulls surround me. Strong bulls of Bashan encircle me. Roaring lions that tear their prey open their mouths wide against me. I am poured out like water, and all of my bones are out of joint. My heart is turned to wax. It is melted within me. My mouth is dried up like a pot shirt, and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You lay me in the dust of death. Dogs surround me. A pack of villains encircles me. They pierce my hands and my feet. All my bones are on display. People stare and gloat over me. They divide my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. But you, Lord, do not be far from me. You are my strength. Come quickly to help me. Deliver me from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dogs. Rescue me from the mouth of the lions. Save me from the horns of the wild oxen. I will declare your name to my people. In the assembly, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, honor him. Revere him, all you descendants of Israel. For he has not despised or scorned the suffering of the afflicted one. He has not hidden his face from him, but has listened to his cry for help. I'll, I'll stop reading there, but you know, you just think, it was almost like on, on the day that Christ was crucified, they were following a script from Psalm 22. That is, that's prophecy. That's God telling people hundreds of years ahead of time what's going to happen and what it's going to be like. And, and Christ was very familiar with this psalm. Uh, and yet those others, they couldn't have known those Roman soldiers. I mean, it's a perfect description of a crucifixion. And what Jesus was going through. And, and yet, the next psalm is Psalm 23. Because Jesus went through Psalm 22, we can have Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. All the good things in Psalm 23 is because we have a shepherd who loves us and was willing to go through what he did to pay the penalty for our sins and make it possible for us to have eternal life. Let, let's pray, if you would stand. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful that Jesus was willing to go to the cross and suffer the, the pain and the shame and the uh, rejection. Uh, and he did it for us because, you know, he loves us. You love us. And Father, we're so thankful for that. Now as we partake of these emblems, I pray that you would bless the cup that represents Christ's blood and the bread that represents his body and that you would bless these emblems that they would be for our spiritual nourishment and that as we partake together here inside and out in the parking lot and even around the world this day as true believers partake of these emblems remembering the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ and he comes again. Father, we just uh, ask that you would continue to guide us, forgive us of our sins, Help us through uh, everything that comes our way and 
and strengthen the church. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Our dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for this day. I thank you for these names. Lord, I pray for each and every one of the names that we've mentioned this morning, Lord, that your will be done. That we understand that your will is a will of joy, of comfort, happiness, kindness, gentleness. All of these things, Lord, come from you. That's what we want. We want your will in our lives. We want to do your will in our lives that we may be a light to others that they know that Jesus died for them. Lord, as we raise these people up and these concerns and Lord and we want to protect our troops and Lord I just pray that you are with our nation that you are with our people here Lord help us to wake up help us to see you first help us to be your people Lord, as Tim comes, I, I, I pray for him. Lord, times are tough. People don't like to hear what Scripture tells them. It might not suit them, Lord, but that is what is the truth. Your Scripture, your will, Lord, I thank you for Tim and his willingness to, to tell us the truth, to help to lead us in a direction that leads to you down the narrow path that leads to eternity. Lord, I thank you for all these things in Jesus' holy name. Amen. I'm going to use a passage of scripture in Nehemiah in the Old Testament, chapter 4. I won't read the whole chapter, just read some passages from it. I like the incident I read about years ago about, uh, it, well, it happened in a, a Maryland, a place called Darlington, Maryland. And there was a woman uh, named Edith, and she saw five of her children gathered in a circle in the middle of the backyard. Something had their rapt attention, but she couldn't see what it was. Well, so she very quietly came up behind them and peeked over their shoulders to see what it was that they were so intent upon, only to discover that in the center of their little circle were five little skunks. <laughs> Suddenly, horrified at what could happen, Edith cried out at the top of her voice, Children, run! Instantly, each child grabbed a skunk and ran, leaving Edith stunned and frustrated. I don't know if you've ever felt like that, but I, I think uh, Nehemiah must have felt that kind of frustration. God had said, Nehemiah, go to Jerusalem and rebuild the wall. I mean, this was uh, after, at the end of the exile. Seventy years they'd been in exile in Babylon. And finally, it's time for God's people to come back to, to Israel, to Jerusalem. Nehemiah goes and He's uh, got permission to rebuild the wall around the city, and it sounded so easy. He must have thought, you know, that's going to be a piece of cake. I can do that, and I can be back here as cupbearer to the, the king in no time at all. And so Nehemiah went to Jerusalem, and he started out on the task of rebuilding that wall with great enthusiasm, but immediately he and his workers met opposition. They met criticism and complaints and mockery. And the result was discouragement. And Nehemiah had to learn how to deal with that kind of discouragement. And what he learned is recorded here in Nehemiah chapter 4. In verses 10 through 12 it reads, Meanwhile the people in Judah said, The strength of the laborers is giving out, 
and there is so much rubble that we cannot rebuild the wall. Also, our enemies said before they know it or see us, we will be right there among them and will kill them and put an end to the work. And then the Jews who lived near them came and told us ten times over, wherever you turn, they will attack us. All kinds of words of discouragement. Right now, we live in a time when we see discouragement all around us. Uh, we feel it. I'm sick of this virus for you. It's not just going to go away, though, just because I'm sick of it. People are getting sick. People will get sick, continue to get sick. I'm thinking about, you know, I, I always get a flu shot in October. It's like, well, I'll probably get one. I don't know if, it, you know, is any, any of the rest of the kind of flu around or did, did that all just go away? <laughs> it's still there, too. How will you know? I guess if you, you know, they'll have tests for it, you know, but... It's like we've got all kinds of things, and now we're, we're in this wonderful political season, the election time. It's, isn't it wonderful? Don't you just enjoy it? You know, all the, the, the sweet will and good humor everywhere. Uh, you know, and, and we're, we're assured that no matter who wins in November, there's going to be riots. And so, you know, it's, <laughs> it's fun. And, and yet, at the, at the same time, we're still the church. God's still on his throne. We still have a great commission. We still have a job to do. We still have a, a, a God who is all powerful. And so, hey, it's good news for us. And we're always sad when we, we hear of, of a loved one who's at the threshold of going on. And yet, for the Christian, that's only good news. Sad for we who are left behind. But it's what we're all looking forward to someday. I mean, if we thought that this was as good as it got, how discouraging would that be? Well, anyway, Nehemiah has got a job to do. He's met with all kinds of opposition and hurdles. And it's no different than it is, is now. You have to learn to deal with those things. So now with that, we, we, we look more closely at the entire passage and we discover, first of all, the source of discouragement. Secondly, the causes of discouragement. And, begin, and uh, finally, how to deal with discouragement when it comes our way. So let's look real quick at the source of discouragement. Verse 10 says, Meanwhile, the people in Judah said, The strength of the laborers is giving out, and there is so much rubble that we cannot rebuild the wall. See, right here it is in the beginning is all the, the discouragement and complaints that are coming Nehemiah's way. You realize who Judah was? On his deathbed, Jacob called his son together and his sons together. And in Genesis 40, verse 10, he said, The scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until he comes to whom it belongs. What Jacob was saying to Judah was this. You will be the leader. You are the chosen tribe to lead God's people until the Messiah comes. So if anybody ought to be leading out in the building of the wall around Jerusalem, it ought to be the people of Judah. They're the leaders. But no, from the people of Judah, Nehemiah received only complaints and discouragement. Yeah, I wonder how often we, we find that those who ought to be helpful and supportive are not in our lives. And that those who should be encouraging us are actually the source of discouragement. It's like, I, was it the bucket of crabs? You know, when one tries to climb out of the bucket, all the others grab him and drag him back down. You know, that, that's sometimes the way it can go. And it ought not to be that way. So don't be crabby, okay? <laughs> now, second, the causes of, of discouragement. Uh, notice that in these verses, we're given four causes of discouragement. And it's interesting how God gives them to us in a very special order. Uh, first of all, we're told that they lost their strength. They're in verse 10 again. The strength of the laborers is giving out. They, they started out with tremendous enthusiasm, but now their strength is beginning to fail. Why? We go back to verse 6. You'll find the answer. It says, we rebuilt the wall till all of it reached half its height. Notice the word, half. They were halfway through. They come halfway, but they still had half to go. You know, an automobile half paid for has got to be one of the most depressing things in the world. Uh, you know, it, it, the newness is worn off. It's, it's got scratches and dents, needs repairs maybe. But you still have just as many payments left as you started with. 
A mountain half climbed can be very depressing. I remember, I think I probably told this before, when I was a, a younger man over in, in Europe and we went with these young people in Czechoslovakia on a youth outing, they were Christians, and uh, we, we climbed up this mountain. It took four hours to climb to the top. And it was beautiful when we got up there, but now we got four hours to climb back down. And it was almost harder going down than it was coming up. Uh, that's exactly the situation that Nehemiah and the children of Israel faced. The wall was half finished, but they still had as much to do as they'd already done. And their strength was gone. They were exhausted and discouraged. Secondly, they lost their vision. Verse 10 goes on to tell us the people of Judah began saying, there's so much rubble. You get the, the picture. Uh, when they started out to build the wall, there was a lot of, of rubble lying around. And so they all pitched in and cleaned it up, stacking the usable bricks and stones together, hauling off all the rest. I remember when we moved from uh, Carterville, Craneville, up to Mount Vernon. And I remember thinking this house is vomiting up more stuff. I just, I know we've, we've literally, we've got to have everything on the truck. And every time I go back in this house, there's more stuff in there. Where did it all come from? It just like is materializing from somewhere. And so here they are working and they started out and it seems like the rubbish and the rubble are just as much as when they started. Then they begin to lose their strength. They begin to lose their vision. The result is that they begin to focus their attention on the piles of rubbish and not on the work to be done. I suppose it's kind of like being a mother with two children in diapers at the same time. Uh, here's a dirty diaper, there's a dirty diaper. Everywhere are mountains of dirty diapers. When those children were born, the mother, mother, I'm sure, had visions of them growing up to be strong and successful, intelligent, beautiful, but right now all she can see is dirty diapers. <laughs> and that's what's happening to Judah. They once had a vision of a completed wall, but now all they see are piles of rubbish. And rubbish is very depressing. And thirdly, they lost their confidence and began to despair. So much rubble that we cannot rebuild the wall. When they first started out, they were supremely confident. They were convinced that Nehemiah was the greatest contractor in the world and that they would rebuild the wall in record time. But now, halfway through, they lost all their confidence. You ever felt that way? Get up in the morning convinced that you're going to seal the deal and that's going to be a successful day, but you don't seal the deal. You feel beat down, unsuccessful. I don't know how many times when I get in the truck early in the morning and I'm thinking, you know, when I get home, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. By the end of the day, the best I can do is get home and eat some supper and climb into bed. <laughs> some days are like that, aren't they? You just get tired. And that's what was happening to them. They, they were uh, overwhelmed by the tasks at hand. Uh, fourthly, they lost their sense of security. Verse 11 says, also our enemies said, before they know it or see us, we will be right there among them and will kill them and put an end to the work. Now, those are strong words. They had enemies who were threatening them and threatening even to kill them, to stop the work. And the people lost their sense of security. Listen again to verse 12. Then the Jews who lived near them came and told us 10 times over, Wherever you turn, they will attack us. They lost their sense of security because their security was in the wrong thing in the first place. How about us? Lots of discouraging things going on in the world, aren't there? Maybe things in your own personal life. You know, life has never got a shortage of discouraging things. And it's true for everybody. So let's look at the people of Judah again. They lost their strength. They lost their vision. They lost their confidence. And they lost their sense of security. And the result was discouragement. Now what can be done about discouragement? Well, that's the third point. Nehemiah realized that he had to do something. You know, you never ignore discouragement any more than you can ignore a flat tire. Uh, flat tires don't fix themselves. I, you know, when something goes wrong in my truck, I always hope that maybe it'll be self-healing. You know, maybe it'll just get better. <laughs> that usually happen. Uh, and, you know, there's just some things that, you you know, you can ignore them for a while, but only for so long. And that's the way it is with discouragement. 
Um, it just doesn't leave by itself. You, you've got to do something about it. What did Nehemiah do? Scripture tells us four things that Nehemiah did. First of all, he saw that there was uh, there needed to be unity among the people. Look at verse 13. He said, Therefore I stationed some of the people behind the lowest points of, points of the wall at exposed places, posting them by families with their swords and spears and bow. What did Nehemiah do? He, he brought people together in family groups so that they would be working together as families and placed them in strategic spots all along the wall that they were building. What had they been doing? Well, they'd been scattered as individuals all along the wall, each one doing his own job where he was, but there was no sense of interdependence, working together as a unit, working in harmony and close association with one another. But now they were working together in families, helping and protecting each other. Now, secondly, Nehemiah realized that he needed to redirect their attention to the Lord. So verse 14 says, after I looked things over, I stood up and said to the nobles, the officials and the rest of the people, don't be afraid of them, the enemies. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight for your brothers, your sons and your daughters, your wives and your homes. You see, the, the, their problem was that they were focused in on, on, on rubbish and that's all they could see. They failed to see that the wall was already half done. They were halfway home and the Lord had brought them there. So Nehemiah says, remember the Lord. Remember who he is and how great and powerful he is. You know, we, we need to do the same thing, don't we? To get our eyes off the rubbish that surrounds us and the problems and the discouragement the things that are going on in the world, we need to look at God again. Keep our eyes focused on Him. Remember who He is and how great He is. He created the world. He hung the stars and the sun and the moon in space. He gave us the breath of life and He promised to watch over and care for us all the days of our lives. And He's done that, hasn't He, up to this point? He's done it. And all the people that I know that are Christians that are even dead now, He did it for them too. My mom and my dad. Uh, my grandma and my grandpa. Uh, he took care of them all the days of their life. Yeah. And he'll do it for us as well. Remember that the Lord has said, don't be anxious about tomorrow. Look at the birds of the air. They don't sow or reap and store away in barns and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they are? It's in Matthew 7, 26. Remember also that in all things, Romans 8, 28, all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. John 3, 16, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believe in him shall not perish but have eternal life. And so Nehemiah says, remember the Lord, get your eyes off the rubbish and remember what he has done and what he is doing. And thirdly, Nehemiah says, we need to rally together. Look at verses 19 and 20. He says, then I said to the nobles, the officials, the rest of the people, the work is extensive and spread out and we are widely separated from each other along the wall. Wherever you hear the sound of the trumpet, join us there. Our God will fight for us. See, we too need a rallying place where we can come with our worries and cares and be strengthened again. We need to get together and encourage one another. That's why church is so important. That's why we don't neglect the assembling together of ourselves. Whether we're out in the parking lot or here, we're here gathering as the people of God, just like Christians are all around the world this very day, different time zones, same day of the week, the, the first day of the week. And we're gathering together as the church of God, as God's called out people. And we, we can't let that go away. Well, God won't let it go away. There'll always be somebody, a remnant, who will be worshiping God. We just want to make sure we're among that number, don't we? Yeah. So that's, that's the important thing. When he says, whenever you hear the sound of the trumpet, Nehemiah says, join us there and God will fight the battle for us. And finally, Nehemiah said, we must help each other. Verses 21 and 22 say, so we continued the work with half the men holding spears from the first light of dawn till the stars came out. At that time, I also said to the people, have every man and his helper stay inside Jerusalem at night so they can serve us as guards by night and workmen by day. You see, Nehemiah realized that the task was so great that it needed everybody working together, helping each other, and that's still true today. 
Folks, if we have the Spirit of Christ in us, then we will be less concerned about ourselves and more concerned about helping others and thus be serving our Lord. And in this day and age, it doesn't matter what virus is out there. It doesn't matter what the political or which way the political winds are blowing. Sure, those things are important. We need to be involved and aware of what's going on. But with God as our God and his Holy Spirit within us, we don't have to doubt our purpose. We don't have to wonder what the future will hold. We don't have to cower in fear over what the future may bring. Our uh, eternity is not uh, riding on uh, who wins in November, although that's important. Uh, our hope is in Jesus Christ and he's coming again someday. And we want to be found faithful right now doing what he wants us to do, no matter what may come. And it may be harder. It may not get easier. You know, we may look back at these as the good old days. I don't know. They used to, you know, you, I remember my grandparents, you know, and the various people talking about the good old days. Yeah, that was what, the, the Depression, World War II, you know, <laughs> the good old days, you know. Uh, you know, but still, God's in our future. God's in our future no matter what happens. God is in our future, and he's bringing us along to where he is. Jesus is our example, and this morning he speaks to us, telling us that he wants to serve us by being our Savior, by giving his blood as a sacrifice for our sins, so that we might be saved and live with him for all eternity. And that's the invitation this morning. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling for you. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. 